I wanted to share something that blessed my heart from Isaiah chapter 55. Um, if you want to turn there, this is a, this is a passage that's often spoken to my heart. And so I just, uh, but, I, but I was blessed afresh as I read from it. And what spoke to me was, this is the, the passage where it says, you know, my word, which goes forth from my mouth, won't return to me without accomplishing what I sent it for. And what blessed me was to see what is the purpose for which God sends his word. I, and this isn't a comprehensive thing, but it blessed me to see this. What's a mark that God's word has accomplished the purpose for which he has sent it? I believe it's related to what we heard earlier from Deuteronomy chapter 28. It says, if you look with me at Isaiah 55 and verse 10, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bear fruit and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word, which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Here's how you know. You will go out with joy and you'll be led forth with peace. So to me, what I took away from that is the purpose that God, the one purpose for which God sends forth his word is that I might go out with joy. That gladness, as we heard, might be a mark of my life and that I might be led forth with peace goes on to say that the mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Um, it blessed me to see you will go out with joy. And God's desire, I believe, as I look at that, is that when his word accomplishes its purpose in my life, that my life is characterized by that joy and that peace, that joy and peace, as it says in Romans chapter 14, the kingdom of God is, God is righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. Um, not as an effort, not as this thing I've got to, I've got to remind myself to be joyful or to be, don't forget to be peaceful, but as an overflow that when the Lord, when the word of the Lord comes, when the Holy Spirit broods upon me, that the effect is peace. The effect is joy. And it's a good litmus test. If my life isn't, if I, if I honestly examine or ask the Lord, forget examine myself, but if I honestly ask the Lord to examine me, and there's not the testimony of joy and peace. I have to confess that. Lord, it doesn't seem your word has gone forth and accomplished that, the purpose for which you've sent it. There should, my life should be marked by joy. And where does that peace come from? I mean, it comes, uh, what, I, what I saw here is, um, you know, it's, as it says just earlier in this passage, Isaiah 55 and verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and God will have compassion on him. He will abundantly pardon. So where does that peace come from? First of all, it comes from peace with God and the unfathomable willingness of God. It says, let him return. So this is someone who is with the Lord. Let him return to the Lord. This one who was with the Lord who has to return, he's, he's gone so far as to, be, to seem wicked and unrighteous, yet God in his mercy and in his compassion is willing. If we return, he will pardon abundantly. And to me, one of the things that I took away as I was thinking practically about what keeps me from peace and joy, one is certainly unconfessed sin, unrepented sin. If I'm not uh, returning to the Lord and seeking to for, totally forsake my way, my unrighteous thoughts, et cetera, I want to have peace. But then I should, as someone who has partaken of the forgiveness of God, another thing that can inhibit my peace, my joy is if I'm not also willing to extend forgiveness, a mark of the heavenly. It goes on here in verse eight, it says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, that's how much higher. God, and his willingness to forgive is evidence of his heavenly mindedness. And one way that I should be demonstrating a heavenly life is in my willingness to abundantly pardon others as well. And it's one thing to say, I want the peace that comes when God pardons me. It's another thing to say, I want the peace, certainly the peace for others that comes when I pardon them, but I want the peace that comes into my heart when I partake of the abundantly forgiving heart of Jesus Christ. 
And I've noticed that that's something that I really have to partake of. And what a couple, a couple of thoughts that I wanted to mention just because they've been helpful to me is don't nurse a hurt or a perceived offense. The mark of a disciple is that a disciple is incredibly difficult to offend. If I find that I take offense easily or I get bothered easily, I haven't partaken of the abundantly pardoning heart of Jesus Christ. I haven't really grabbed a hold of that. And I've noticed there's different ways that I can kind of, um, I can uh, be easy on a hurt. You know, what does it mean to nurse a hurt? It means I'm, you know, like if you nurse an injury, you kind of, you, you don't use that arm, right? You picture like putting your arm in a sling. If I'm nursing a hurt, what am I doing? I kind of coddle it. What does a disciple do? Cut it off be violent with it. Anytime I feel in my heart, and I've noticed this, even in the context of, of church fellowship, there can be a perceived slight or an inconvenience or, you know, hurt feelings, whatever. Do I nurse it? And do I go, oh, I wonder, you know, that was probably premeditated, you know, like, or do I go, no, I'm going to be violent with that. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I want to be like Jesus Christ. I want to abundantly pardon. And just as Brother Zach has talked about that God sitting in heaven saying, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. Do I have the attitude of this brother, say there's some, you know, perceived inconvenience or hurt. This brother never even has to say he's sorry. I've already forgiven him. Not with the attitude of if he should ever come to apologize, I'm going to be sure to tell him I forgave you long ago. Nothing like that. But in my heart, am I holding on to a grievance or have I already let it go? And um, I was thinking about what Jesus says in Luke chapter 12. He says, he's so forgiving. He says, Anyone can speak a word against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven him. And I thought about, that's in uh, Luke 12, verse 10. And I thought, wow, can I say that? Anyone can speak a word against me, it's going to be forgiven me. Jesus Christ had no, he didn't harbor a grudge or, or nurse an offense or anything like that. I don't, I don't want to either. Um, and I would say, furthermore, what about a correction? What about a rebuke? You know, we heard about in the context of our, we've talked about, Priam was sharing earlier about, you know, uh, being a servant, even as the head of our home, being a servant in our home. What do I do when I get difficult feedback in the context of my home? I get constructive criticism. Do I, am I indignant? Am I justifying myself? Or even, what if it's totally wrong? What I've found is, Will I be diligent to look for the, the even 1% of it that's true, the 1% of it that's right? And in my own experience, even in the last week, I felt like I was wrongly, you know, uh, uh, criticized for something. But I was blessed by considering it saying, what truth is there here? What, prop, you know, it, like, I, I, I can't remember where it says it. Somewhere it says, why not rather be wrong? You guys, you take each other to court. Why not rather be wrong? And we can almost, we can have that attitude of we want to appear before the court. Let me explain my thought process. Let me explain what I was. You don't understand exactly. And we just, it's like we're, we're appealing to a judge. Why not rather be wrong? Do I have the attitude of I'm the defense attorney now? If so, I'm, I'm not humble. I'm not willing to, to, to extend pardon quickly. And I want to do that. And there's a verse, um, which again, reminded me of what we heard earlier from uh, Deuteronomy 29. It mentioned a root of poison in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, if you turn there with me, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, it says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. How do we come short of the grace of God? That a root of bitterness might spring up and cause trouble and by it many be defiled. And I was struck to see that that tendency towards being offended, the tendency towards nursing a grudge or offense or, or being hurt by a correction, it's a root of bitterness that can, I like that, that word from Deuteronomy 29. It's like wormwood. It's like poison. And it doesn't just poison me. It poisons others insofar as I, I believe this with all my heart. As it says in um, Ephesians chapter four and verse 16, the body is fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. Insofar as there's a root of bitterness that springs up in my heart, what is it, what's a way in which many are defiled? Where there's division, I'm incapable of bringing that which 
God intends for me to bring for the building up of the church. And for you, for us brothers, anytime there's a root of bitterness in any one of our hearts for any, any slight, we aren't able to supply as a joint, as an individual member of the body, what God intends to, for the building up of the body through us. And that's part of the way in which many might be defiled because the body fails to be built up because we're harboring that. The other small point I wanted to make about forgiveness the, and as it pertains God's word accomplishing the purpose for which he sent it, which is that we might be led forth with joy and peace. One thing is seeking God's forgiveness. The second thing is extending forgiveness. But then the third thing is seeking forgiveness from others when I've made a mistake and being radical about, and I've noticed that my peace can be robbed. I don't know if you've had this experience, you know, like Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, verse 23, I think he says, here we can look there <clears throat> just to make sure it's the right one. It's in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five. Yeah, he says, therefore, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and you remember your brother has something against you, leave your offering at the altar and be reconciled to your brother. So there it's not that I need to forgive someone. It's that someone needs to forgive me. My service should be interrupted by a zeal to go and ask forgiveness. And um, I've noticed that that can rob my joy and my peace. Not that, that, that I need to forgive someone, but that as I've asked the Lord to search my heart, he brings someone to mind who I just need to apologize to. It could be, as we heard earlier, apologize to a child, even. Apologize to my spouse, apologize to a brother, apologize to an unbelieving coworker. But having that attitude, I'm willing to leave my gift at the altar. It's so easy, as we were hearing earlier, as Sunil was mentioning, I think, in reflection on what Kyle was sharing, it's so easy to get caught up with our work of service. We say, this is the most important thing. And what the Lord says is, I'd rather you leave your service. Go first be reconciled to your brother and then come give your gift. And uh, I'll just close by sharing what it, just how the passage we started with in Isaiah chapter 55, what's the result of this um, being led forth in, <clears throat> um, in joy and peace? Verse 12, Isaiah 55 and verse 12, it says, you will go out with joy. You'll be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you. The trees of the field will clap their hands. And look with me at verse 13. Instead of the thorn bush, the cypress will come up. And instead of the nettle, the myrtle will come up. And it will be a memorial to the Lord. And that's what I wanted to mention. An everlasting sign which will not be cut off. What will be a memorial to the Lord? In my margin, it says the transformation of the desert will be a memorial or an everlasting name to the Lord. But I think that, that may be old covenant. What's, what's the transformation of the desert in the new covenant? That my heart might be totally conformed to the image and nature of Jesus Christ and might be a perfect reflection. And what's the outcome of that? That it's an everlasting sign about God's goodness and power. The result of his word, accomplishing joy and peace in my heart, peace with God, peace with men, for abundant in pardon towards others and abundant in seeking pardon from others is that an everlasting name would be accomplished for the Lord. This transformation of this desert heart, so to speak. I picture my heart like this barren desert where only thorn bushes and nettle are growing. But when I partake of, you know, God's, when his word comes home to my heart with power and accomplishes the purpose for which he sent it, the cypress, I was reading about the cypress, they grow incredibly quickly. It's apparently one of the best trees if you want some, some uh, you know, hedge to be built quickly. The myrtle is apparently used for healing. This, that the Lord wants to accomplish growth and healing, and he wants to demonstrate his uh, power through that. It will be a memorial to the Lord, an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. And I thought of 1 Corinthians 13 or 12, I guess, where it says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. They won't be cut off. You know, an everlasting memorial which won't be cut off is the transformation the Lord is able to accomplish in our lives when, he, uh, when his word accomplishes its purpose. And it will bring him glory and bring him honor. I was blessed by that hope that the Lord would be um, exalted by that transformation in my heart.